Are you out in the field? Buenos dias, Margaret. <laughs> Have a good, good morning. Hi, everybody. It is a beautiful day. I was hoping that the mist would actually stick around a little bit longer because uh, earlier this morning when I was driving into work, it was like a fantasy world out here. You couldn't see hardly any distance. It was all misty out here and the, um, the, the spider webs were glistening and it was very magical looking. But the sun has been rising and it has uh, burned off the mist and it is a beautiful day. I'm excited for a couple of reasons. One is our special guest today is my wife, Emily Angel, who is a biologist, wildlife biologist. She was on almost a year ago uh, in showing her skull collection. People really liked it. So I thought, hey, let's do it again. So today, uh, Margaret is going to show some skulls at the Learning Center. And then Emily's at our house with her. I think she's got her phone. And she'll be showing some of her skull collection. She's got some cool stuff. And talking about how do you actually prepare skulls? Let's say you uh, you found find something cool. Or maybe you've uh, hunted something. Or you know somebody who's a hunter. And they say, hey, do you want this cool skull? What do you do with it? How do you clean it and make it look nice? That's what she's going to talk about. Um, I was actually this morning hiking out to the spot that I had picked out and, and planned for when some color caught my eye. There's a beautiful bloom happening right here. So I'm about halfway out to the spot and I was like, it's too good for me to pass it by. So I'm going to show you this little short little flower that's down on the ground. And I've got my macro lens today too. So I'll We'll all zoom in on it. So let me show you what I found. Sometimes it's like, well, maybe it's even the best part really of doing these is, is being surprised. Coming out here to, uh, to see what's going on. I mean, I was just here last week, thought I had the area scoped out pretty well, come back and a plant I had walked right past last week because it wasn't blooming, didn't even notice it. And now it has these gorgeous light purple flowers with these delicate little dots on them. Uh, this is a mint and let's see if it smells. It doesn't have a real strong smell, uh, just an earthy plant smell. I'm gonna just pull off a little leaf here. See if I crush it up a little bit. See if it, not a real strong smell, but my goodness, these are really pretty. This is, this is a flower that I, I had a hard time at first figuring out what it was. I put it in iNaturalist and it was giving me these bogus answers that I knew were wrong. And then in the back of my brain, something clicked and I said, oh, I think it's ashes calamint. I looked that up and said, yes, that's what it is. Okay, let's, let's get the macro lens and take a closer look here. Okay, give me a sec to get one of these in focus for you. There we are. Oh, gosh. Look, it still has dew drops on it. Take a look at the, oop, get it back in there again. Can I get my shadow out of the way for you? There we go. Oh my goodness, that's a really pretty little flower. And if you're familiar with, with mints at all, you can see that that, you know, definitely looks like a mint flower. I don't know if it's picking up it on here, but there's some tiny little dots there. Um, those are to help guide insects in. Pretty sure this one is pollinated by bees. And I wish I had known this was out here because I would have double checked this, but I, I believe there's a, a rare bee, like a super rare bee that pollinates this. And I'll double check that and email it to the, the folks who are registered. And my guess also is that if you could see an ultraviolet, 
and took a look at this, that those little dots there probably, um, let me get a little bit better. Yeah, there's those little dots. Probably um, reflect in ultraviolet. Let's take a look at another one. Oh my goodness. So pretty. Uh, probably reflect in ultraviolet. And you know, the bees, when they're looking at these plants, they're seeing things that we're not seeing. These plants are guiding them in here because they want to get pollinated by them. You can see those little structures at the top right there. Those, are when the bee is coming in to get its nectar here, the, ooh, <laughs> those will deposit some pollen on the bee. Very, very cool. Okay, I'm gonna turn this around. Oh man, what a nice find. What a beautiful find this morning. And that's why you, you've got to return to the same places over and over again in nature because you just don't know what you're going to see um, every time you're out there and throughout the year, you get the different seasons. Super cool. Okay, I'm gonna keep hiking out to get to the, to the spot that I, that I had prepared for me. But in the meantime, I'm going to go back to Margaret because she's going to talk a little bit about skulls. When you're out here, um, you're probably not going to see a, a mammal walking around. Maybe you see a squirrel. Sometimes you see deer around here. It's pretty rare that you actually see a bear or a panther or something like that. Uh, but let's take a look at some skulls and see what what can you know about an animal if all you have is the skull? All right, Margaret, back to you. All righty. Hello, everybody. Let me make sure I took that spotlight off of Dustin. Did I? Ooh. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. I have a few skulls to show you all. There are two tips that Dustin and I use when looking at mammal skulls that make it a lot easier to understand a little bit about what type of mammal um, that it was. So I'll start with this skull right here. And if anybody has any guess as to what type of animal this is, you can put it in the chat right now. Um, but this is the first skull I'll show you all. And there are two things we look at to know more about the skull are the eyes and also the teeth. So we have a saying that we like to say, which is eyes to the side likes to hide and eyes to the front likes to hunt. So these eyes, if you can tell, are pointing forward. These eyes are looking forward. And what that means, eyes to the front likes to hunt, is that this animal is a predator. Now I'm seeing in the chat right now that someone said dog, that's super close. This is a wild animal that lives in the central Florida area. Um, and it's very, very closely related to a dog if anybody else wants to try to guess what it is. Yes, I see it, it's a coyote. That's exactly what this is. And coyotes are predators. Um, so they do like to hunt other animals so their eyes are to the front to help them track down those animals that they're hunting. The opposite of that is eyes to the side, as I mentioned, likes to hide. And I think you'll all be able to guess what this skull is. Um, but this is a white-tailed deer. And its eyes, if you can tell, are to the side. So if you look at it face on, you'll see that those are more pointed out. And that's because they're um, hiding, theoretically, from predators. And they have these eyes to the side to help them have better, better peripheral vision and see when larger predators are coming. So eyes to the side likes to hide, eyes to the front likes to hunt. And then the other thing that we look at on skulls, mammal skulls specifically, to tell us more about it is its teeth. And its teeth can tell us if this animal is a meat eater or if it's a non-meat eater. So for example, white-tailed deer, we know that white-tailed deer are non-meat eaters or herbivores because they have these really flat teeth right here meant for grinding up grasses. So flat teeth versus shark teeth are really what we're looking for at this point. If we go back to look at the coyote skull, you'll see that there's some pretty sharp teeth here. And so this lets us know that the coyote is gonna be eating meat. Now, coyotes are actually omnivores, so they can eat both plants and meat, but we can tell at least from these really sharp teeth that they can also eat meat, which is the important thing to know. 
I'll show you two more skulls really quickly. Um, if anybody wants to guess what this animal is right here, um, from what we know from looking at it. Oh, I see cat. That's really, really close. It's going to be again a wild animal, um, but that's coming from the Riley family. These are also found in Virginia as well as Florida. Um, they're slightly larger versions of cats, but yep, bobcat, absolutely. The eyes are to the front, so you know it likes to hunt, and it's got these really sharp teeth, so you know it's a meat eater. And then lastly, we have this skull. And this skull is probably our trickiest skull to guess. Most people have a hard time getting it. Um, if you have any guesses for what it is, you can see eyes right here are to the side. So we know that this animal is a animal of prey. And then I don't see any guesses, but I'll go ahead with this. As you can see that they have really uh, flat teeth right here. I see rodent. That's a really good guess. It's close. Um, a lot of times we get birds with this. Uh, people think maybe it's an eagle, giant bird of prey, but um, it's not because birds don't have teeth. And this animal obviously has teeth. Um, it's close to a rodent. It's a rabbit. Nice. Awesome. So this is a rabbit. And so those are our big tips for looking at uh, different types of skulls is looking at the teeth to know what it eats and then looking at its eyes to know if it's an animal of prey or if it's a predator. Dustin? Thanks, Margaret. Rabbit skulls are one of my favorites. When I was learning skulls for the first time, you know, years ago, trying to ID the different ones, it just seemed like the most bizarre looking skull. And it does challenge people. We have shown thousands and thousands of children those skulls and tried to get them to guess what they were. And that might be the hardest one that's there. People always think it's a bird or maybe they think it's a rodent. And even knowing that it's a rabbit, you might say, well, is a rabbit a rodent? I don't know. Here's a cool trick on this. Uh, if you, It's hard to show it on the webcam, but if you looked up real close behind the front teeth, the incisors on the rabbit, you'd see they have an extra set of teeth. Behind the front incisors are extra incisors. I don't know why they're there, but it lets you know that it's in the rabbit family and not the rodent family. So even if you had skulls of extinct animals, ones that may have gone extinct 10,000 years ago when the last ice age ended, and you're looking and you're going, what is this? Is this a rodent? Is this a rabbit? You can look ah, right back there. Does it have extra teeth? When I'm thinking of skulls, I'm always thinking of these, you know, extinct animals. And when I am out in a beautiful place like this, I have to remind myself, because it's so easy to forget, I have to remind myself how many species aren't here anymore. Now, there are modern species that have gone extinct because people have either you know, overhunted them or for things like that. And Florida has some species like that. But there's also those big megafauna that went extinct around 10,000 years ago. And scientists are still trying to figure out, was that because of humans overhunting them? Was it because climate change at the end of the ice age changed the habitat? Scientists are still trying to figure it out. But right where I am here, if I could be in my time machine 12,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago during the Ice Age, there might have been a giant, uh, like a glyptodont, which is related to armadillos, but the size of a VW bug of a small car might have been walking around through here. Or a giant ground sloth which when they stood up on their hind feet, they were something like nine feet tall or something. I mean, amazing animals that live right here. And the plants and the animals that are still here today, their ancestors shared this place with them. And when we think about the adaptations, both the physical adaptations and the behavioral adaptations of animals uh, in North America today, well, those things evolved right alongside those other animals that aren't here today. So think of all these stories and puzzles, like why does this animal do that? 
maybe because of a relationship it used to have. That's the same for the plants as well as for the animals. I want to show you this other plant right here. This one is does not have a pretty flower on it, but it's a pretty cool tree that I get excited about when I see it. It's a scrub hickory. One of the reasons I like this is because uh, Archbold today is in the town of Venus, Florida. Venus like the goddess of love. But a hundred years ago, this part of Florida was called Hycoria or Hycora. And used to have a post office and everything and that's not here anymore and now it's part of venus but it was actually the town was named by a botanist named uh john kunkel small he when the railroad was coming in the early 1900s he said hey you've got to stop right there you should call it hycoria which used to be the scientific name for uh, hickory trees. <laughs> so whenever I see this, I just feel that little piece of history there. I love it. This is also one of the only plants around here that loses its leaves in the winter. We just had our, our spring equinox last week, and here we are. This has got its leaves coming back here, but a month ago, it was totally barren. No, there is something cool on here I want to zoom in on. And I saw a few of them. Now I got to find them. Yet. Here we go. There are some galls on here. Let's see if you can see what I'm talking about here. Can you see that there's some, there's a little bumpy <laughs> growth right here? Almost looks like a potato or something growing on this. And there's actually a lot of them on here and, and different sizes. This is about a medium sized one. Um, this is not a natural part of the tree. This is something that has laid its eggs in here. Some insect has laid its eggs in here. And then the plant has grown this little, uh, I don't know what you call it, a scab, a growth. They call it a gall. To, and it's doing it because the, the uh, egg you know, it had produced a chemical telling it to do it. So the egg is being protected. And let's put on our... Um, macro lens here, and we'll take a closer look at one of these. Let's get up close here. Oh, it might be too, is it too dark to get it? There we go. Get some, let me get some sunshine on there. Try not to walk into a cactus. Oh, here we go, some sunshine. There it is. Have a weird looking, <laughs> a weird looking thing here growing on there yeah this looks a lot different than the ones i see on oaks i'm used to seeing the oak galls and this has a really different look to it um, and let's take a peek at the at the leaves here so you can see see how th this is the hickory and see how the edge of the hickory leaf looks like a serrated knife that's oops get in focus again yeah see how it looks like a edge of a serrated knife that's one of the ways you can tell that this is a hickory that's beautiful the light coming through okay let me switch back and there i am <laughs> okay so we're gonna go to emily and i know that she's pulled out some interesting skulls that she has in her collection and she's also going to teach us a little bit about preserving skulls so uh, so emily what do you have to show us hey everybody can you see me hey guys i um, hear you there, there you are there you go i'm gonna apologize it keeps getting really loud out here i've got a couple neighbors doing yard work so it's quiet right now but uh Welcome to my backyard. Um, here's a few of my favorite skulls I've brought out to show you guys. And uh, I wanted to start by talking about some of the other things we can learn from looking at skulls. So Margaret was talking about how you can look at their, their teeth and the position of their eyes to find out whether they're you know predator or herbivore. You can also find out sometimes how they died by looking at their skull. So for example, this is a little, uh, a small gator that I found at work one day. And if you look right back, here, 
this is a bullet hole, actually. That's not supposed to be there. So somebody, uh, some hunter or someone had come along and uh, actually shot this guy right in the back of his head. So that's how this guy died. Um, here, this is a really cool example. So this is a bighorn sheep, not from around here, obviously. But if you see this big old hole here, that is not his eye socket. This is degenerative bone that just got eaten away by something. I was told it may have been a bot fly. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but bot flies, they actually lay their eggs and the larvae will burrow into the skull. So that could be what this was, or he could have had some sort of bone disease or something, but it just completely ate away his skull here. And actually the spongy looking tissue around here is where the bone was trying to heal itself. But um, I don't know how successful that was. He may have died from this or he may have died from something else. I'm not sure, but whatever it was, he was living with something pretty nasty there. And sometimes you can see smaller examples of this too. This is actually a, a beaver, um, also not from around here, from out west. But if you see up close here, he also had some degenerative bone here. And he, he has a couple examples of that. There's another one right there. Um, it's kind of all over his skull in little places. So he may have had some sort of bone disease or something that was just wearing away this bone. Um, and again, he may not have died from that. He, he may have just been living with it, but it's, uh, it's interesting to look at the skulls and figure out how these animals may have lived and died. So what I get asked a lot is, um, you know, how do you, how do you make these skulls look so beautiful and white? You know, they're so clean. So if you were to find you know, an animal, a dead animal or skull out in the woods. Um, you know, there's, there's a process to cleaning it up. What I'm talking about right now is actually going to be step two, and I'll talk about step one a little bit later. But say you've got a skull that most, most of the uh, flesh is gone. You know, it might just be a little, little bits clinging to it or it might just be on kind of dirty. Maybe you found it and it's just got dirt on it. Um, the easiest way to clean these is actually a very basic thing. You get a nice little jar here or some sort of container that can fit your skull and good old hydrogen peroxide. It's just the 3%. You can buy it from any store, you know, grocery store, Walmart, uh, pharmacy, wherever. And you just pour that in with your skull there. You know, you put them right in there and pour, pour the peroxide in and leave it for maybe a few weeks or so. And this serves a few different purposes. First of all, it breaks down whatever tissues are left, you know, little bits of clinging skin or fur, any kind of thing like that breaks them down. Um, it also bleaches them and turns them into this really nice white color for you. And also helps to disinfect them. So you don't have to worry as much about handling these things that used to be a dead animal, right? So it serves all those purposes. Uh, one thing you don't ever wanna use um, straight from the bottle. Yeah, I use it straight from the bottle. It's, it's a 3% solution, so it's already pretty diluted. If you went and bought it from like a like a salon supply store, it would be a much higher concentration. But that 3%, it won't hurt the bone or anything. Uh, so yeah, one thing people think they can use is bleach. And you don't want to use bleach. It will whiten it, but it will also break down the bone. Um, I actually tried that once with some fish bones I found, and they were really, really stinky. And I tried putting them in bleach. This is before I knew about peroxide. And within a week or so, they just disintegrated. So you don't want to use bleach, um, just not the best idea. Oh, the one thing with your jar, if you've got your jar with your skull and peroxide, you want to keep it out of the sun because the sun will actually break down that peroxide and basically turn it back into water. So then it won't do anything. So I like to keep it either in a garage or um, you know under a dark cabinet or something. Just keep it out of the sun. Um, one other bad thing that can happen, since it's breaking down those tissues, it is, is it also breaks down connective tissues. So, you know, these aren't just one bone. These are a whole bunch of bones that are held together. So sometimes after they've been in the peroxide bath for a while, sometimes some of those bones will fall apart and you have to kind of um, put them back together like a puzzle and use a glue. I use just like a clear, crazy glue just to glue those bits back together. Um, here's an example. If you see that this is a, this is a Florida gar that I found here in Florida. Um, I don't know if you can see this little hole here is actually a piece of bone that went missing during this whole process. So I'd never got to glue it back in. But if I'd had that, I could just glue it back in and, and make it all whole again. Um, one thing that happens too is with the teeth. Uh, there's a nice Florida black bear. 
uh, how long to leave it in. I leave it in usually for a few weeks. Um, I tend to forget about them. So if you leave them in too long, it won't hurt anything. The peroxide kind of gets used up and turns into water and eventually evaporates. So it doesn't hurt if you leave it in too long. You can always check it in a couple weeks and see how it's doing. Um, but yeah, the other thing is with the teeth, the teeth can um, get loose after the animal dies. So another thing I like to do is, is glue the teeth back in so they don't get loose and you don't lose them. I explored a black bear there. Um, yeah, so that's it about, about step two here. Uh, let's go back to Dustin. Thank you. And we will uh, go back to Emily again in, in a few minutes. I know she's got one more thing she wants to show us. I, uh, before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about oak trees and the different oaks that you find in this part of Florida. If you were with us last week, I was out in the same general area. This is a part of Archbold called Red Hill. I'm at around 200 feet in elevation right now, which if you're not in Florida, that seems like it's not very high at all. If you are in Florida, you're going, what did he just say? 200 feet? That's like a mountain. <laughs> this is one of the literally one of the highest spots in the peninsula of Florida, uh, right here at Archbold. And like I said, it's called Red Hill. The reason it's called Red Hill is that the, the sand here, even though it's mostly white, if you start digging around in it, will, you will see a little bit of color. I can show you an example right here. So here is this, you know, mostly white sand, but look right here where the ants have dug it up. The sand has a little bit of different color here. Looks a little more yellow or orangish. And, you know, there's lots of gopher tortoises around and you'll see when they're digging up the soil that you'll see that uh, yellowish or orangish, orangish sand. So even though this is called, this a presentation is called Intro to the Scrub, Sometimes I like to go onto these other high spots where it looks a lot like the scrub, but technically it's actually a sandhill habitat. They're, they're both rare habitats found on Florida's dry, uh, sandy upland areas. And they share almost all the same species, but they do have a few species that are different. So I'll show you one that's different. Come over here. And I love it because I'm not usually I'm not usually in the um, the Sandhill area too much. So when I am here, I always get excited about this tree right here. And this is an oak tree. And I'd love to see any guesses if anybody knows this. Usually when we're showing people oak trees in the scrub, we're talking about all these all these other little ones here that look more like bushes and don't really look like what people think an oak tree is supposed to look like, this one actually does. And it is called the turkey oak. The shape of the leaf looks a bit like a foot of a turkey. <laughs> so it's the turkey oak. I'm in, a, I'm in a group of other educators and we're called the League of Environmental Educators in Florida, LEAF. And this is our symbol, is the turkey oak. I'm gonna switch this around. I don't have the macro lens on, but I just wanna show you the light looks really pretty right now. Looking through, uh, as it shines through these leaves, take a look at these beautiful turkey oak leaves. And can imagine, I was saying how they kind of look like a, like a turkey foot. <laughs> here we go, I'm just gonna give you a beautiful view right here. And if I just move over a little bit, we'll get to, here's one of the scrub oaks. So this one here, you can see looks a lot different. This is called a sand live oak. And again, turkey oak, sand live oak. There we go in focus. And oh, look, they're both in the same shot. Oh, that's great. And the other one right next to it, actually, the other, the other ones that are right over here are, these look like, I think those are myrtle oaks. They've got fresh leaves because it's spring. They lose their leaves really fast and regrow them. Sometimes it's hard to tell when they're growing new leaves what it is. I think that's a myrtle oak, not 100% sure. But notice how 
the scrub one is darker. It's it's very it's hard. It feels like leather. And the turkey oak feels more like a I don't know, a regular leaf, <laughs> regular leaf. It doesn't have that that thick outer part that protects against the sun like you get with the, the one of these scrub oaks here. Okay, I'm going to flip back around. We only have um, we only have a, a minute here before I got to turn it back over to, to Emily. Um, but I just want to say I love oak trees. Don't 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 you feel like they're kind of special? My my ancestors in Ireland long time ago, they saw the oak as like the most special tree. And you know, we saw it as this very special tree and used it for different kinds of medicines. If you ever see um, the the Irish uh, tree of life, you might see it on tattoos. Actually, Emily has one on her wrist. That's an oak tree. And they're, of course, talking about the Irish oak tree. They don't have any of these scrub oaks. Um, but one of the things that's awesome about oaks is they live for a long time. That Irish oak tree could live for around a thousand years. And if you ever come to this part of Florida and go to Highlands Hammock State Park, they have an oak tree there that's something like a thousand years old. So the, the Irish would say it takes 300 years for the oak to, to be born, 300 years for it to live, and 300 years for it to die. And for our oaks here in the scrub, the, the four scrub oak species, we don't know how old they live. Because if you try to count the tree rings, all it will tell you is when the last fire was. The fire burns them down, then they pop right back up from their roots. The turkey oak can also pop up from its roots. And uh, we don't know how old it is, but could be 1,000, could be 5,000, we're not sure. The only thing that we have been able to really measure is the age of the palmettos around here. And there's a palmetto, there's some palmettos right here and actually this is the wrong kind of palmetto <laughs> this is a scrub palmetto but we have so the the saw palmettos and those ones are 5,000 years old on average uh, they're clonal groups they grew from a seed 5,000 years ago and the oldest was 8,000 years that we found here the oaks might be the same okay I know we're running out of time here how do you measure palmetto when we do the q and I can tell you how it's pretty cool and well, let's go back to Emily because I know she's got something else she wants to show us. Some some yeah. skull she's got waiting for us. All right, yeah, Emily. Back. Hopefully, you can see me. Uh, sorry, still kind of loud out here. So this is going to be step one. If you find a nice juicy skull, it's stinky. It still has a lot of the flesh and the skin and maybe some fur on it. What do you do with it, right? When I found that gar, that little fish skull, it was a full fish and it smelled awful, right? So, so what do you do? Uh, there's a few things you can do. One is probably the simplest, and that's the one I do, and I'll show you, is just to bury it. Or um, I guess you can kind of leave it out, but mo mostly burying it. Because around here, we actually have burying beetles that will, that will take the skulls, of the, the animals, and actually bury them in the ground. And then they, they eat and break down all that tissue. So it just is a matter of time before you get a nice, uh, a nice skull out of that. And that's when it might come out a little dirty and then you put it in the peroxide. Another thing you can do is boil it, but this is a really messy process. It smells awful. You don't, you know, you wanna have a special pot that you don't use to, you know, cook your food in. Um, yeah, and you don't really wanna be doing that in your kitchen because again, it smells terrible. And it also tends to make the skulls very greasy because it takes the fat that's in the, the, the flesh and kind of, it kind of soaks into the bone, which sounds gross. Uh, but yeah, it kind of gives that greasy feel to it and you never really get it completely white. So I don't like to do that. And also the boiling can, can damage smaller skulls. Uh, one other thing is called maceration. Um, I guess kind of similar to boiling, not quite. And this is again, something you want to do outside. You can just have a tub of water and put your dead animal in it and just leave it. And eventually it's just de decomposing and the bacteria starts to break it down over time. Very stinky process. You want to put it, you know, far away in your yard where you're not going to smell it. But eventually it will break down that flesh and you'll just be left with bones. Um, another way is using beetles. If you guys have ever heard of dermestid beetles, it's a special kind of beetle. Um, museums actually use these. They'll have their entire dermestid beetle colonies. And you just, you know, put an animal in there and they just eat all the meat and flesh right off of it. 
And hobbyists can actually, um, oh, someone used to make a cage of hardware cloth. Yes, yes, very good. Um, that's an excellent way to do that. Yeah, the uh, the dermestid beetles, you can actually order them online and have, have a colony at home if you wanted, if you're a hobbyist. You just have to feed them meat and things when you don't have a dead animal to feed them. I've never tried it yet, but I, I might someday. But I'm just gonna tell you about the, uh, the most basic one I use, which is the, I'm trying to figure out how to flip it around here. Here we go. So I have this, this old tub here in a, a back part of my backyard. And the most important part is you want to leave space for little critters to get in, like flies and beetles, but not enough space that things can get at, can get in and steal your skulls because um, possums and raccoons and even cats will come and dig these up and they will take them. And I've lost a lot of skulls that way. So I just have a top on this. I actually bungee this closed. So we'll open that up. And this is just this, this is just sand and dirt in there. So this tub here, it actually goes into the ground so that nothing can burrow underneath it. So if you look in here, you'll see some old, uh, old bits of bones and things. And um, I do wanna caution you. So this, this can take a few weeks. It's kind of fun to come out and check on it and see how it's doing. But one word of caution, if you leave things in too long, like this was a duck skull I came and checked on, I actually left this in a little too long and some of the bones have fallen off and I can't quite find them. So if you forget about them in here, I mean, they will eventually break down completely. Um, but yeah, you might come out and, re oh, there's another piece of that <laughs> duck, that's Bill. But you might come out and realize, uh, oh, my, my animal's gone, it's not in here. Well, you just wanna dig down a little bit because the bearing beetles will actually just bury it right in there. So one thing I do have in here though, if you can see is a, is a little snake skeleton. I found this little dead snake a little while ago. It might just be a little racer. And I just threw this in here whole. The, the beetles didn't actually bury it. It's just still sitting here on the top. And if you see here, here's this little skull. Um, I've had bad luck with snakes. Their, their skulls are very fragile and they're made of so many little tiny bones. Um, you can almost see his little teeth there. But so there's his skull and you can see there's still a little bit of um, flesh and scales on top of it. So what I would do now is I've got my little pickle jar here. I'll just throw that right in there. I've got my peroxide and just uh, pour a little of that in. I don't need much because it's such a tiny skull. And um, I mean, that's, that's it. There's not much there. There's not much flesh, but if there was a lot of flesh on it, you might see it start to bubble a bunch. And that's the peroxide uh, kind of doing its job and, and breaking down that tissue. So yeah, pretty cool stuff, huh? All right, back to you, Doug. Thank you, thank you. Uh, loved it. <laughs> yeah, we definitely do forget that things are back there. And then it's like, oh wait, how long has that duck skull been in there? Oh, it's been a while. <laughs> Well, we are, um, we're done with the field trip portion. Hopefully you can stick around for some q and A. Q &A. I know that there was already one question about how do you measure the salt palmettos. Uh, so I'll do that one real quick. We do have a video about this on our YouTube on how to measure them. And we have um, on our education website on the Archbold section, if you go to elementary schools, you can you can download for free like how how to actually do this um, and and we have a curriculum called discovering the Florida scrub and you can do the whole activity with your with your kids or with your students so I wish I had a good one right in front of me here I don't but when you see a saw palmetto you'll notice it has we call them alligator backs the uh, behind it there it's like the trunk and um, those we measured over something like 20 years or, or more, Warren Abe Abrahamson measured hundreds and hundreds of these every year and figured out that they grow about a half an inch a year. That's it. 1.2 centimeters on average um, on the sites where he was measuring here at Archbolt. That's because a, a, a palmetto is like a palm tree. It's, it's not really a tree. It's not related to trees so it doesn't grow wider with tree rings it only grows at the growing tip at the end so that growing tip is just getting a little bit you know further along every year 
And if you measure them for 30, 40 years, you'll see that that's as much as it grows a year. So if you have one in front of you that's, you know, this big, that might be 80 years of growth right there. The other, the other part is that um, they are clonal. So they're also growing underground, sending rhizomes out. Uh, it's a special kind of stem and then popping up in other places. So what, what Abe did was take a genetic sample like a paternity test of a whole bunch of these in an area to see which ones were from the same seeds. You couldn't just dig up the whole area because their, their connections were broken long ago. These are thousands of years old. So if you know that the same one over there, you know, it's 50 feet over that way is from the same seed as the one right here, you can figure out based on the, the estimate of uh, 1.2 centimeters per year uh, that it's thousands and thousands of years old. That's the, that's the short version of how to do that. But I will attach, uh, I'll put the link to the video and the um, activity in the email that I send out. And if you're, I don't, I don't have it to throw it in right now, but I'll stick it on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, I'll get that video and stick it in the comment section on Facebook. Okay, do we have any other questions? Awesome. Uh, we have just a couple more questions today. So a few of them going back to the insect gall. Um, the first one, they kind of go together, but the first one is, does it grow off the stem? And then the other question is, do all insect galls on plants form from plant tissue responding to chemicals from the insect eggs? Oh, good questions. Uh, I'm not next to that one anymore, but there's different types of galls. And sometimes you'll see them on the leaf itself. Sometimes they're like um, just on the woody material. It depends on the species. For the, I don't know about the hickory, but for the oaks, we have something like 80 different species of oak um, gall wasps, tiny little wasps, and that's what does it on the oaks. But you can also see uh, galls made from fungus. So it's not always an insect. Some of them are fungal. If you see a leaf that just looks super uh, like um, weird, <laughs> that's not a good, <laughs> maybe it has a weird color to it and it's just totally misshapen. Maybe it looks kind of pink or something like that. That is a fungal gall. But, but yeah, those ones that I, that I was showing you, uh, I assume the, they're similar to the, to the oak ones where it's a, it's a um, wasp doing it. It could be wrong there. And the, but the ones on the oaks, the, they, the mom comes, she plants her egg under the bark of the oak tree, and then the egg produces a chemical that induces the, the plant to grow that little home for it. And it, they're not all the same, they're different. You can dissect them. And we, we have a whole collection of these at Archbold. Some of them actually have some architecture to them. It's pretty cool. Some of them are more complex than you would expect. Uh, every species is, is different. Oak gulls are like a super cool thing. I can attach to the email, we have a guide to galls at Archbold that we made for visitors and I'll attach that to the email. All right, any skull questions for Emily? Um, I am not seeing any skull questions. There is a follow-up question to the galls that I'll go ahead and do. Did the galls uh, harm the plant at all or does the plant just grow around it? Well, the gall is, I don't know if they officially call it a parasite because the gall, well, I guess the insect is a parasite. Um, the tree is not getting any benefits that we're aware of from the, from the gall, but I also don't, I'm not aware of the, of the trees really getting injured by them. Maybe if there was like hundreds of them on a single tree, but when you're looking around, some trees do have, you maybe see a dozen of them on there, but um, I'm not aware of any of them being a, a, like an actual uh, a real stressor that would kill a tree. There are plenty of diseases out there that insects carry uh, that kill trees, but I'm not aware of any that are, that are from galls specifically. Alrighty, and we do have a question for Emily, um, which is, 
there was a skull in your collection that looked like maybe it was a bird with a long beak. What was that one? Hi. Oh, can we see? Hang on, I'm trying to get myself back in uh, view here. I think it's still turned around. One second. Hang on, computer issues here. There we go. Hey, here I am. Okay. Yes, um, good catch. So you do have to be careful with bird skulls because most of them are actually illegal to collect. Uh, there's the federal law called the Migratory Bird Act, and it's it's basically to keep birds safe because, you know, if you have a bird skull in your collection, you can't really prove that you didn't kill it yourself, that you just found it on the ground. So do be very careful about bird skulls. The one um, exception is game birds. So this one is actually a snipe. Um, and you're right, he's got this really long bill here and this little tiny, tiny brain case. So snipe are a game species. So things like um, the snipe, the, the ducks, uh, turkey, things like that, you, you can keep pieces from them. But this, yeah, the snipe, this long bill kind of gives you an idea of how it feeds. It's gonna poke that long bill into mud and actually um, pull up little insects and, and bits, of, uh, bits of things down in the mud. So yeah, pretty cool. Another question for you, Emily, is does this process work if you're looking for other bones besides the skull? So, if, for example, if you want to do that, the snake skeleton that you had in the its actual uh, spine, would you do the same process? Yeah, yeah, because the uh, the skull bones, are they're just bones like any other. So, yeah, you could do that with anything. I could do it with the snake vertebra. Um, if you just found like a cool cow vertebra or something neat like that. I mean, you're only limited by the size of the container you need and how much peroxide you want. Um, so yeah, any, any bone will do. You can whiten it that way. Mm -hmm. And then going back to the birds, do you need a hunting license to keep game bird skulls or any other game animals? I don't believe so. That's a good question. I've never heard that though. I don't think you need a hunting license just to keep just to keep things. This this one was actually um, hunted at the range where I work. Um, and I had a friend who worked in the recreation office. So she gave me this because the person didn't want the head. They just wanted the meat from it. So um, yeah, so it was hunted, but not by me. I don't think you need a license. And then I think we only have one more question, which is good because we've gone a little over time. But this is actually for Dustin about the oaks. Do all of the oaks produce some type of acorn? Yeah, and the acorns look a little different. Uh, right now it's it's spring, so we don't have acorns. What we have are actually are flowers. It's you don't think of a of a oak as flowering, but I will turn my camera around here. Can you see this right here? These little little bits hanging down. Oaks are wind pollinated. So these are their flowers. They're called catkins. Uh, and oop, there I broke one off. Um, and the wind will send their pollen around. And, and this time of the year, you're probably aware of this because you can might get it on your car or, or sometimes you'll see if there's like a puddle of water there, you might see a bunch of pollen on it. But in the fall, they get their acorns on them. And yeah, some acorns are big, some are small. Some uh, have a lot of tannin in it and are very bitter and you wouldn't, wouldn't want to eat it. Other ones aren't and you can crush it up for the flour and, and make food with it. Even those bitter ones though, if you properly prepare them and leach out the, the bitter chemicals, then you can use it as a food source. And oaks have been used as a food source since, you know, I don't know, forever, <laughs> basically. And some people around the world are still, are still um, using acorns for food. Awesome. That looks like that's all of our questions for today. Um, but if there's one that we missed, we will, as always, put the answer in our email afterwards, as well as we will send the videos that Dustin referred to earlier. Um, Dustin, do you have any last words? Uh, thank you, Emily. I guess I'm going to have to make her like a really good dinner tonight. Say thank you. <laughs> she can pick the movie. Uh, that we watch. Um, anyway, oh, I do want to plug the Summer Ecology Club. We had the slide up of it earlier. Right now, the page went went up. So if you go to if you go to the Archbold website, you can go to the education. You'll see if you have questions on there. It has questions or has answers about um, like frequently asked questions. 
the registration itself uh, should be up any day. Hopefully it'll be up later this week. So we're just, just wrapping up getting the, the registration together, but it'll be really fun. It'll be mostly virtual. So we can have people all, all over the country participating, doing things like like we're doing today and meeting scientists as well as some other stuff. And then we will have some, we're planning for some in-person activities. Uh, we want to do seasonal pond visits. If all is going okay with the virus and we keep our numbers down and have social distancing and masks, we feel like we can do that. If, if nothing, if it doesn't get worse and if it gets better, then we'll be able to have some more in-person activities too. Uh, yeah, so just want to plug that. Thank you all. We'll be back again next Tuesday. So hasta pronto, amigos. See you later. Thanks, y'all. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.